The Lord be with you. I'm so glad that you can join us for what will be our last Wednesday Bible study of 2020. We have been going continuously since March, and as we move into Thanksgiving and Advent, it's time for a break. But before we get into the scripture, I need to say a few thank yous and give a few shout outs. There's a lot that you don't see on the other side of this camera uh, that I see and I'm so thankful for. And so there are two individuals who have made Wednesday Bible studies possible. And so I need to recognize them. The first, Trevor McPherson, our associate pastor of families, has expanded his job description in enormous ways. And we are so grateful that he has shared his gifts and his talents with us. And also Connor Strickland, uh, who has shared his digital media skills with us. I am so thankful to you both for, for giving your time and uh, and, and being willing to do anything that has been asked of you during this crazy season. Thank you. We're moving into Romans chapter 11, verses 17 to 24 here. Verses 17 to 24. And what we're thinking about is our attitude toward the church, toward God's people. And when I say church, I don't mean a building, I mean the redeemed of all the ages past, present, and future. What is our attitude toward the church? In Paul's time, and writing to the Romans, he's writing to a church that is composed of both Jews and Gentiles. And there's some friction between them. You have Jews who realize that the promises of God, as recorded in the Old Testament, are first and foremost directed toward them. They have the benefit of God's covenant, of God's revelation. They know that, and they're grateful. And now they have come to believe that Jesus is God's promised Messiah. But in that same group of people, you have Gentiles who otherwise didn't know about God's promises and yet have received them by faith and who also believe that Jesus is God's chosen Messiah. And so there's some friction, though, because you have newcomers and then you have old comers. And how are they to mix? And there's the potential for one to be prideful, one to say, well, we were here first. Another one to say, well, we received that and so many of your Jewish brethren are not receiving the good news, so we're superior in some way. That's what Paul's wrestling with. But today we have some of the same challenges because we fluctuate between two different extremes when it comes to thinking about the church, God's people. On the one hand, we can become possessive. We've been in church for a while, and so we start to think, well, this is my church. Have you ever said that? I'm so thankful for my church, or I'm not very happy with my church right now. Have you thought that way? Have you heard people think that way? Well, we all do from time to time. We talk about our church. We seem to think that we are owners of the church. And if anything gets changed, if anything is different, if anything is not to our liking, look out, right? But on the other extreme, we can become dismissive of the church, especially those of us who haven't grown up in the church, those of us who do not have any relationship with a church. We can think that church is for religious people or that it belongs to the clergy or to priests or to people who are super spiritual. And some people stand off from the church and say, that's not for me, that doesn't belong to me, that's for them, it's theirs. What we need to see in Romans 11 is that the church, God's people, it's not yours, it's not mine, it's not theirs, it's his. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because it cannot exist apart from God's promises that are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So be encouraged by this. God's promises do not depend on you or on me. God's promises depend on him and his power and his sovereignty. And there is so much freedom in that to know that we are the ones depending on God's promises. God doesn't need us. And yet he has revealed that he wants us to be a part of his people. But we can't ever forget that. We are completely dependent upon God's promises, both in getting in and living in God's 
church and in staying in God's church. We are completely dependent on God's promises. So let's see how this is. I'm picking up our reading in verse 17. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? What we see in these verses is Paul, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, comparing the church, God's people, to an olive tree, a cultivated olive tree. And this is in keeping with what we find in the prophets. Jeremiah 11, Hosea 14, they compare Israel, God's people, to an olive tree. And there's an olive tree that has been cared for, that has been nurtured. And then we have a wild olive tree. And Paul is saying that this cultivated olive tree symbolizes God's people and Israel. And then this wild olive tree symbolizes everyone else, the Gentiles. And that God, for his own sovereign reasons, and in his own sovereign ways, has chosen for some of those natural branches to be broken off. And for wild branches from that wild olive tree to be grafted in, to grow into the one tree of God's redeemed people. And this shows us that we are completely dependent on God's promises to get into God's people, to enter into this thing we call the church, the gathered people, the called out people. And we can't forget this. We see in verses 17 to 18 that we only derive strength the richness, the nourishing sap from the olive root because of God's promises. We can't take any credit for that. We are dependent on God's promises. And there's some debate about what is the root? What is the root here? Some say it's the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Others say it's the promises. I think there's reason for believing it symbolizes the promises of God uh, in Romans 4 verse 12, Paul says, and he is then also, that is Abraham, the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. And so Paul's reaching back to Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3, where God comes to Abraham and he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And through you, I'm going to bless the nations. I'm going to bless the world. That's God's promise to form a people, to assemble a people that is ever expanding, ever reconciling with other people, drawing them in, pulling them in, all by the power of his grace exercised through faith, receiving those promises. So the root symbolizes God's promises that go all the way back to Abraham and the people that have assembled around Abraham and the faith of Abraham. So he says, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. 
if you belong to the church of Jesus Christ, if you can say that I have been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that I have no standing based on anything I have done or said, my standing is entirely based on God's sovereign grace, his free grace poured out for a sinner like me. If you can say that, remember that you're standing on a foundation that God has established. And that root, the, the strength of, of life, of God's power to heal and to bless and to save, well, you're standing on that foundation. You can't take any credit for that. Don't ever forget that. Don't think that you are better than anyone else who's in this body of believers. This is not your church. It's Jesus' church. It's not my church. It's not for super religious people or super spiritual people. We all get in the same way because when it comes to our standing before a holy and righteous God, we're all on the same level. Paul has established clearly in Romans 3 that everyone, Jew, Gentile, everyone, stands on the same basis. We are all sinners. We are all unworthy before a holy and righteous God. None of us has any basis for claiming standing before this God. So don't ever forget that. And so we all have gained entrance in the same way, by his grace and for his glory, received by faith. That's how we get in. We are dependent on God's promises to get in. But we are also dependent on God's promises to live in. Once we've gained entrance into this cultivated olive tree, we live into it in the same way. You will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. God broke off for his own mysterious and sovereign reasons some of the natural branches, some of the ethnic Jews, and he's made room for Gentiles. And you see this in the book of Acts. When Paul, when Peter, when others go to preach the gospel, they start in the synagogue. And it is only when the gospel receives a cold audience in the synagogue that they pivot toward the Gentiles. And this is all for God's sovereign, mysterious reasons to extend his gospel, to extend the good news to Gentiles, to the nations, as he promised Abraham. So that's true, granted, granted, very well. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. So do not be arrogant, but tremble, literally be fearful, fear, fear God. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. When you live in the cultivated olive tree, when you live in the church, there is no room for pride. We all have to remain humble and recognizing I don't deserve to be here. I'm only here because of God's work in my life, because the Holy Spirit was at work in my heart, drawing me in. I can't take any credit for this. So we, there's no room for a superiority, inferi inferiority complex in the church of Jesus Christ. We all get in on the same basis and we, and we live in on the same basis. We're here by faith. Don't ever forget that. And we are all equally dependent in drawing our strength and drawing our help from the saving power of God's promises. And it's available to you. It's available to me. It's available to everyone. No one should stand off from the church and think, oh, I don't want to come in because I might be crashing someone else's party. No, this is available to everyone. It's a question of whether you will receive it or not. We all get in because of God's promises and we live on the basis of God's promises. And God's promises don't depend on us. And that's liberating because it means even when we stumble, even when we make mistakes, even when we sin, we realize God's got this. God is in control. God is sovereign. He is God and we are not. And then we see that we are dependent on God's promises to stay in. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Kindness toward you. God has been kind to a sinner, an unworthy sinner like you and like me. Don't ever forget that. And also remember that God is a holy, righteous God. He will judge. And if you see God's sternness and God's severity exercised towards someone else, 
Don't get puffed up with pride. Be humbled by that. Fear God. Not to be paralyzed by that fear, but to be humbled by that and to have a proper reverence and a proper respect for who God is. And then Paul's going to argue that they're only outside these branches that have been lopped off. They've been lopped off because of their unbelief, because they haven't trusted God, because they haven't received the promises of God. They've rejected God's promises. They have not received Jesus as God's promised Messiah. But in the same way that God is able to cut them off, God is able to graft them back in. And he's making a comparison to say, if it's possible for God to graft in a wild olive branch, like you Gentiles, if God can do that for you Gentiles, well, how much more is God able to graft in natural branches? This is their tree after all. These are the people of God's covenant. These are the people who have received God's revelation. They have the testaments. They have all of those good gifts. Well, yes, they're sinners just like you and like me. They have so much revelation that they should be thankful for and that should point them to receiving God's ultimate fulfillment of his promises in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if God can do that, God can do anything. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And so it brings us to where we started. How do you see God's people? Are you going to get possessive and think this is my church? I deserve to be here. I've been a member here for umpteen years and they better not change one thing about it without getting my permission. Or are you going to be dismissive of, of God's people and God's church and say, ah, I don't think that's for me. I haven't been in years. I don't really know the rituals. I don't know the traditions. I just don't know enough about the Bible to really go. That's for those churchy people, those religious people. No, it's for everyone. Come, don't put it off, don't delay. It's for you, it's for me, it's for whoever will believe and receive the gospel by grace through faith. But don't get puffed up. Don't think you deserve it. Don't think that somehow you are inherently worthy of it. You're only worthy insofar as you receive the gospel of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. So I pray that through this message, God would draw you to be humble in your attitude to his people and his church. It's his church but also that you'd be bold to come to receive what is right here. It's available by the power of the Holy Spirit wherever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you haven't done, whatever you said, whatever you've left unsaid, it's available to you, you, whoever you are. Will you receive it and say, yes, God, I want your promises. I believe your promises. I believe they are for me. I want to belong to your people because I believe that's the only safe place in this world. Will you receive it? I pray that you would as we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for reminding us that your church, your people, it doesn't belong to any one of us. And there's nothing that we can do or say to take any credit for your people. Your people exist because of your promises. Lord, help us to be humble enough to confess that and to acknowledge that. But I pray, Lord, that in our humility, if we have received these promises, that we would recognize that there are so many around us, people we interact with in person or online. There are so many people, there are family members, there are friends who, who think that these promises are not for them who think that, that they are sufficient in and of themselves. Lord, help us to make it clear to them as you equip us and empower us by your Holy Spirit to say, this is for you, receive it. God has been gracious to a sinner like you. Lord, help us to be bold in that proclamation. We know we have so many things to be thankful for, even in the midst of this trying season, this trying year, very difficult year. But I pray that whatever else we may be thankful for, that we would give thanks for the gift of church, the gift of your people, that we have a place to belong. Even when we feel rejected by the rest of the world, we know we have a place of belonging, all because of your sovereign and gracious promises. 
that reach their fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So glad you could join us. I hope that all of these Bible studies have been a blessing and an encouragement to you and your family. Maybe this break will give you some time to go back and, and fill in any that, that you may have missed. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube. I pray that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family and a wonderful Advent season. I hope to see you again in 2021.